If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. This morning we're going to start a study of Daniel chapter 12 as I announced in our class Wednesday night. There is no way we can get through this whole chapter discussing what needs to be discussed in this one class setting. So we're going to conclude our study of Daniel 12 Wednesday night, but we are going to get, a, get started this morning. And I hope our study of the book of Daniel this quarter has been rewarding. It's rewarded me because there's been a lot of sections in the, in the book that I haven't really done much in-depth studying on. It's made me work harder, study harder, and uh, I've gained a greater appreciation for the book of Daniel, especially the last few chapters of the book. As we begin this morning, you would know, if you note on page 208 of our book, if you, we're going to read the introductory part there, and I like what our book no, observes here. Page 208 in the introductory part. And uh, you can follow, you can follow right, right along as, I, as we go through there. Our book notes that the final three chapters of Daniel are among the most difficult in the Bible to interpret. In Daniel 7 and 8, God revealed to the prophet that great empires would rise and fall in the New East, in the Near East, in the following centuries. The prayer of the Judean wise man followed in chapter 9. After that, a personage appeared to Daniel who described ongoing conflicts between the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greeks in chapter 10 and verse number 5. Michael, apparently an angel or an archangel, we'll get more into that, but identified as one of the chief priests had come to assist in chapter 10, verses 13 and 21. In Daniel chapter 12, the prophet continued the words of comfort and strength he had given Darius since the first year of his rule, according to chapter 11 and verse number 1. After the conquest of the Near East by the Greeks in the late 4th century B.C., the Jews who had returned to Judea from Babylon continued to struggle for existence. Between the writing of Malachi and the early 2nd century B.C., we know little about them. They reemerge in the apocryphal work called First Maccabees in the midst of oppression by Greek rulers. Persecution by the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes led to a revolt in the eventual independence of the Jews. From about 167 B.C. until about 63 B.C., a Jewish priestly family of the Hasmonean name ruled an independent or a near-independent kingdom of the Jews in Canaan. Historians tend to call it the Maccabean kingdom, named for its first military leader, nicknamed the Maccabee, which means the hammer. Daniel 11 is about conflicts and intrigues between Greek kingdoms ruled by the Ptolemy and the Seleucid family that led up to the Jewish revolt, chapter 10, verse number 14. The final chapter of Daniel is a continuation of the message the prophet gave to Darius in 11, chapter 11 and verse 1. Chapter 12 to, appears to be an elaboration on chapter 11, verses 40 and following. And as we're going to note, that's where things switch gears. But it really begins to switch gears in verse number 36, as we're going to discuss. Recognizing then that Daniel 12 is a continuation of chapters 10 and 11, and it is helpful when studying to disregard the chapter divisions. Remember... In the original, there were no chapter and verse divisions. So it's helpful when studying to disregard the chapter divisions and read these three chapters as a single unit to observe the continuity of purpose. And so it's necessary to refer back to chapters 10 and 11 at times in this study because they all are connected together. The key passage as we think about Daniel chapter 12, as we approach this study, I would suggest the key passage might well be the question asked in verse number 8. When, when Daniel asked the question, what shall be the end of these things? That is, the things that had been previously talked about up to that particular moment in time. And in fact, before the revelation ceases to Daniel, there's going to be a little more information added to that in verses 10 and following. And so, 
Verse number 8 indicates, did Daniel, this indicates, did Daniel fully understand, did he fully comprehend what he had been told? He did not. His, here you have a prophet of God, and, and he's sort of boggled by it, is he not? You remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse, verses 10 through 12, that, that the apostles, that the prophets of old desired to, to know further the things that they had Sir, inquired and searched dil, dil, diligently of. And, um, but even they didn't know what it was. Even the angels inquired to look into these matters. And so this further attests to us the divine origin of the message. Because Daniel, who was a faithful servant of God, he was t- seeing these things. He was writing these things. But he, even he couldn't fully comprehend these matters. And, uh, but the be- question is begged then, what, the, what, would, what are these events discussed? What are they? What, what are we dealing with? In fact, when would they come to an end? Is this a specific reference to the final end of all things, or does it refer to an end to something else, though there would be applications pertaining to the final end. And these are some questions that we have to consider as we go through this chapter. But as we be- begin this discussion, first of all, I want to give you some keys to help helping us understand. First of all, we need to consider the time frame of these visions Daniel saw. Obviously, they had a definitive starting point. Remember the, the great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw? How many four... How many... How many world empires did he see? And I sort of spat out the, the answer there. There you go, Sister Gail, four. And which empire was the first? Or where does this begin? Babylon. Exactly right. And of course, we see this again with the vision of the four beasts in Daniel 7. Those four beasts correspond to the four aspects of that great image. Now, if Babylon's the first, if Medo-Persia is the second, if the Greeks are the third, then who's the fourth? That would be the Rome. So we have to understand this t- definitive, this time frame. They have a definitive starting point and an ending point, days of the Roman Empire. And so the time covered by Daniel, I would suggest, is limited to these events related by the four world empires. And it certainly would be no later. Uh, Understanding the time frame will help us as we approach the text. And keep also in mind, and I think it's important we spend a little time on this because of the difficult nature of the section of Scripture we are dealing with. Keep in mind as well that the word time, the principle of time, is emphasized throughout this chapter. Twice in verse 1 we see the term time. Two different ways. At that time and time of trouble. Time of the end in verse number 4. So we are dealing with time. God is dealing with time here. And so what do we learn about the time of the end of things in Daniel chapter 12? What is God saying prophetically to and through Daniel and then what are some valuable lessons which we, will prob- which we will get to Wednesday night that we can learn from a study of this chapter? And that's what I hope, and that's what I want us to consider as we go throughout this discussion of Daniel chapter 12. And so, first of all, as we delve into the chapter now with, the back- with this background, and I think it's very important, it's important we have a under- basic understanding of the background before we actually dive off into the text. With these things in mind, look at verses 1 through 4. And let's read, let's look at the proclamation. If someone would, read these four verses for us. Daniel 12, 1 through 4. Shall run 
run to and fro, and knowledge shall be free. Thank you, Sister Gail. First of all, notice verse 1. We have the distress. And notice how this verse begins with an end. And again, we know in basic English this is a coordinating conjunction. And so it joins together what has been previously revealed. That is, it joins together chapters 10 and 11. Thus, there is that connection. And it joins together what has been revealed to what is now going to be revealed and discussed. Now, we might ask, at what time? This is, this is the key question here, at what time? And I believe in my personal study, and as I studied this, to answer this, we go back to chapter 11 and verse number 45 where it talks about he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now we might ask, who is the he of verse number 45? Well, it states he is the king of the north. But again, this is vague in general. Who is the king of the north? That's not telling us much. Well, again, you've got to move back further into chapter 11. You, you go back to ver chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. You know, we're introduced to Darius, the time frame in which these vis this last vision takes place, the first year of Darius the Mede. And, and I think it's interesting to note that, you know, these, Daniel saw this during da Darius' first year on the throne there in Babylon and ruling the province of Babylon, which would also place it around these visions around the same time that Daniel had his experience in the lion's den. So that helps give us a little historical perspective as to when this vision occurred. And it helps us place it, helps us put it into historical context as it relates to the historical aspects of the book. Now, beginning with Darius, several Persian rulers are introduced. Verse number two, three kings in Persia, the fourth shall be richer than the further. But then we're also told in verse three that a mighty king of Greece would overcome the last Persian ruler and rule an even larger empire. And we're not left in the dark on this. In fact, he, he is referred to as the king of Grecia, and we know who he is, Alexander the Great. There's no questioning who this would be. Alexander's kingdom upon his death, according to verse 4, would be divided among four of his generals after he died. And as we talked about in the previous lesson, I believe it was from chapter 8, in the vision of the ram and he-goat, these two established dynasties would be the Ptolemies in Egypt to the south and the Seleucids to the north. And these two, two armies, these two factions, controlled most of Alexander's former empire. And uh, the originator of the Ptolemies, Ptolemy I or Soter, was strong to begin with, and he controlled Egypt. Hence, 11 verse 5 refers to them as the king of the south. The king of the north in this context, in, in the early part of the chapter, refers to the Seleucids, which began with Seleucius I Nic Nicator in 312 B.C. And, he could, and they controlled much of the former Persian territory, in particular Syria. And the individual referenced here in chapter 11, in particular verses 21 through 35, is Antiochus IV. And we discussed him a couple of weeks ago. But now we come to verses 36 through 45, and it seems that the he changes up. Who is the he here? Some scholars, and I believe our book, believes, can, says, continues to say that it is Antiochus. But I don't think that fits here. In my study, I do not I think there's a change here between verse 35 and 36. If it isn't a Greek ruler, what, is, what, what options are we left with as to, as to the he? And it could be more than one ruler, but but the singular standing for the whole. Any ideas? I would suggest in 11 verse 36 and following that the he is referencing the Roman Empire. 
again, as I studied it, as I look, you know, as I looked at looked at this section, as I studied these chapters this past week, that's the only conclusion I could come up with. And I give you three reasons. Number one, the king of verse 36 is that of the north. We understand that. But, and, and we understand, as we pointed out, the Seleucids referred to as such because they, their rule was to the north when compared with the Ptolemies to the south. However, when compared with Egypt as to direction, Rome could also be referred to as the king of the north. That's my first piece of evidence that I give you as to why I come to this conclusion personally. Now, you may disagree, and we can disagree on this. I you know, it's not anything that's going to cause us to sin, and brethren disagree as to, as to this. But I'm giving you what I believe in my own personal study, and I encourage you to investigate the history behind this yourself. Number two... Second line of evidence is we got to remember the period covered by the by the book from the Babylonians to to the Ro to the Roman Empire during which God would set up his eternal kingdom Daniel 2:44 and 45 to end the book with 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 the, with Antiochus would be anticlimactic and certainly it would result in the kingdom not being established remember the kingdom was established in the days of the fourth world empire and we understand that that fourth world empire was established when Christ made his promise in Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. But not only did he promise to build his church, what did he promise to give to his apostles? The Holy Spirit, yeah. Well, the Holy Spirit, obviously, to guide them into all truth, but he also promised to give them some keys. Keys that would unlock what? And the Holy Spirit guided them to unlock, the, to unlock, to use these keys. We understand that. So what you just said connects into what we're saying, Brother Ricky. So what, what, what keys were they given? What keys did Christ promise to give them? And what keys would they use as guided by the Holy Spirit? Keys to the what? Keys to the kingdom. Matthew 16, verse 19. So we come to the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. We see that great sermon preached by the Apostle Peter. And, he, and again, remember the Holy Spirit guided him, and, he, and the Holy Spirit guided him to quote from the prophet Joel, from David in the Psalms, saying, These prophecies are fulfilled in Christ. Now, what did the multitude ask in verse number 37 after Peter had affirmed that this same Jesus whom you have, whom you have crucified? God hath made him both Lord and Christ. What did they, what, what was their response to those penetrating words in verse 37? What we do? There you go, Sister Gail. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And as we've talked about before, this is this the same as asking the question, what must I do to be saved, is it not? It's the same to what the Philippian jailer asked in Acts 16.30. So Peter gave the answer in Acts 2:38. Now, who got it? Now, did Peter come up with those words, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, on his own"? Who who authorized him to speak those words? God through the Holy Spirit. That's how, that's a Holy Spirit given command, and remember, the Holy Spirit revealed the will of the Father. And so that's a Holy Spirit directive. All mankind must repent and be baptized in order to do what? In order to obtain what? Remission of sins. Verse 41. 3,000 souls obeyed the, gospel, obeyed the gospel that day. What, to what were they added? To the church. But to be added to the church is to be added to the kingdom, Colossians 1.13. So, do we not see one of the keys of the kingdom used on the day of Pentecost? Open the door to the Jews. The kingdom was open to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. When? During the days of the Roman Empire, Fourth World Empire. Then you come to Acts chapter 10. Cornelius and his household, first Gentile converts, they entered the kingdom second key was used to open the door to the Gentiles. So we see from the book of Acts 
that the promise of God that, da that Daniel discussed with Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 was fulfilled. The, the eternal kingdom has been established and it is an indestructible kingdom. And it has filled the whole earth through the proclamation of the gospel. And it was, it was set up in the days of the Fourth World Empire. And again, this, we say all of this to show that if the book ends, the book of Daniel ends with Antiochus or the Greeks in control, it's, it's anticlimactic. That, doesn't, that would be an anticlimactic and would result without the kingdom being established. But we do know it was established. Again, look at 11, chapter 11, verse 45. Here, I think, is the third piece of evidence as to why this refers to the Roman Empire. It's described as be, this, he, this king of the north, is described as being in such a position of authority that they could set their standards at will, including in Judah. And further, when you look at the history of this, of Rome, though they would be viewed as seemingly in invincible, was Rome indestructible? They thought they were, but they weren't. Again, I think there's an application for our country today, is there not? Do many in our nation today think America is indestructible? Could we, could we consider that? Would we be correct in assuming that there are those of Americans who believe that nothing can ever happen to the United States of America? Well, there you go, Brother Carl, and we're going to discuss this more in our lesson tonight. Yeah. Indeed. But I would suggest as well, America is not a godless nation. They serve, God. we, many Americans serve gods. We're going to discuss this in the sermon. They just serve the wrong gods. Serve idols. And it's interesting to note as well, Sister Nana, you, you look at the Roman Empire, some of the same problems afflicting America today, not much has really changed. You, you look at some of the same problems, such as, you know, the love, materialism, a love for stuff, a love of money. See that with Rome. Homosexuality. We think, it's, we think America's got, a, got the corner, corner marketed on this problem. Rome had just as big a problem with it. In fact, Rome promoted it just as much Roman government promoted it just as much as, as if not more than our government today there is a lot of similarities to be drawn between Rome and modern day America and it just shows us times may have changed but the behavior of men man really hasn't has it he continues to choose the path of unrighteousness he continues to choose the path of ungodliness. And is it, could it also be the case as well? Let's ask this question as also. Could it also be the case that so many people living today just think God is not in control? Do we think, do, do, does people think that, well, God's, God doesn't care. He's not in control of things. If he was, we wouldn't live in such a messed up society. And the answer is, and here's a, good an, here's a good answer to that, Brother Ricky, because of the choices people make. Choices. We, are free, we, we have free will. God created. Can you imagine what it would be like if God just simply made mankind as pre-programmed robots? This particular man lost his, right. lost his grandson in a swing go accident. Mm -hmm. He's happy with God, but this happened. And that's why... And when people ha and when things like that happen, people tend to question God. I've been guilty of that myself. Mm -hmm. we, I think we all have. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? 
Again, we're going we're gonna to look some more at this tonight in our lesson on providence in the book of Daniel, and we'll especially look at it when we come to the book of Job. But you look, at da- you look at the book of Daniel, and I know we're getting a little off track now, but I think it's, good, I think it's a good question to ask. Were God's, were, were God's people then, Daniel, he was faithful. And his three, Hebrew, his three friends were faithful. But were they immune from suffering? Look, they were, you know, think about, think about this. At the outset of the book, they were removed from their homeland and carried away into a foreign country. That was out of their control. That, you know, they had to suffer, they suffered some of the consequence of the, of the sins of the nation. But did that mean God stopped caring for them? Just because they had to go through that? I would suggest no. Uh, look at the Apostle Paul. You know, we talk about bad things happening. Look, look, at, look at all that happened to the Apostle Paul there, written in 1 Corinthians 11, all the hardships, the turmoil he went through. He even had that thorn in the flesh, remember, and he besought God thrice to have it removed. But what did God tell him? Grace is, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. And... I don't want to get too much into this because we're going to discuss it more tonight. But as we... Romans 5, 3 and 4 produces steadfastness. Yeah. Well, in a couple of weeks, well, in a couple of weeks, week after next, we're going to dis- discuss that too, facing trials. So we'll get more into that as well. But ultimately, I think the problem comes down to as to the results of when sin first entered the world. That changed everything, did it not? And again, you you, you look at you look at Job. I think perhaps Job best answers the question. Righteous man, godly man. He lost everything. He had a lot of bad things happen to him. But did he... And he didn't understand everything. You know, we, let's not kid ourselves. But did Job blame God? The, the devil already has the souls of the unrighteous. Mm-hmm. There you go. And remember, Job accused God of placing a hedge around Job. And, Job. and Satan charged God, if you take away the hedge, he won't serve you faithfully. And Job was tested, but he remained. Even though he said some things out of line, he never cursed God with his mouth. And, and I think it's important. Job shows us God doesn't hedge, the, hedge us in. He doesn't place a hedge around us or special to protect us. There are just things that happen in this life we can't understand. You know, natural disasters happen. I don't know why they happen. Brother Carl? You know, uh, in the war, when we were back, God was with us. We knew that. But now you don't know it, folks. People in general are taking God out of everything. Mm-hmm. And, and we stopped on the battlefield if we could. And we had to sit up there right down the side of it. And we had a chaplain who would read from the Bible. And that's what, what we've got out on our golden war. Right. And we are faced with troubles. We are faced with trials. We are faced with suffering. And I think that's going to help us understanding the problem of suffering but also the possibility of overcoming it by faith in God. I think that's going to be one of the keys we find, one of the principles we find here in our study of Daniel 12. If you trust in God, if you have faith in God, you're going to endure no matter what. If you rely upon God, you can endure. 
And Daniel's going to, and, and God's going to give a picture of, of triumph to those who overcome later on in the book. With these things said, we need to, we need to get on. I, I would like to get through at least verse 4 before, before we, class concludes. Uh, we, all, we are introduced as well to the helper here, Michael. In a, he's introduced in chapter 10, verses 13 and 21. He is a chief priest, and of course you look in the book of Jude, and go all the way to the book of Jude, and you look, read verse 9 of, Jude, of Jude's book, you will find that he is referred to as an archangel. And his name means, who is like God? And he appears as a representative of God, and his responsibility was to keep a vigilant watch over God's people, contextually would be the Jews. Now look at the trouble as well. And even with his help, we're told there would be a terrible time of trouble for God's people. And this would be the time of the abomination of desolation. Christ talked about this as well in Matthew 24, verses 14 and following. And this terrible clash between the Jews and the Romans in the Roman occupation, which resulted in J Jerusalem's destruction in the end. And Israel ended as a nation in AD 70, as a physical nation. And certainly that fulfilled Daniel 10, verse 14, when, when Daniel was told, What shall befall thy people in the latter days, those being the last days of the Jewish nation? It would be the, the, the final end of Israel as a nation. Uh, the temple was destroyed. And again, this was 40 years after the kingdom was established. Thus, God's promises were fulfilled. He brought an end to the complete final end to Judaism. Now, Judaism had already been taken out of the way at the cross. We know that, Colossians 2, verse 14. Christ fulfilled the law in his obedience to it and in his fulfilling prophecy, Matthew 5, 17. But yet you also recognize, even after the gospel came into effect, that, the Jews, that there were certain Jews who continued to cling to these things. Did they not? You read the book of Acts. You look at Romans 10, verse 2, the Jews then, Paul's desire was for all Israel to be saved, but they had not submitted themselves into God's righteousness, the gospel, but rather they went about to set up their own righteousness by continuing to try to keep the law of Moses, which God had already done away with and which God no longer recognized. And, but in AD, when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, well... All the genealogies were destroyed that were recorded in the temple. So no, you know, you think about Judaism today. Those who claim to be Jews, they cannot trace their lineage back now because of what occurred then. Again, we see God's providential foresight in these matters, showing to us the, the supremacy, the betterness, as, as the book, book of Hebrews points out, of Christianity. But we also see here a deliverance. Thy people shall be delivered, everyone written in the book. Again, God's true people would be delivered, not the literal Jews, but those who belong to Christ then. Do you realize that when Jerusalem was destroyed, not a single Christian was lost in the destruction? Not a single Christian perished. They were delivered as promised. And we know they were Christians because the kingdom had been established as promised in Acts 2, the days of the Fourth World Empire, and it had been in existence for some 40 years prior to this event. And remember, Matthew 24, Christ provided the key by which his people would be able to recognize the event and told them to flee the city when the Roman armies appeared. When you see the Roman armies, you get out of there. You don't flee. If you're on a housetop, you don't go in. You don't pack your bags. You get out of there. And this is also seen in Luke 21, verse, verse 20. So that helps us better understand verse 1. Now, verses 2 and 3. We have the, the awakening. Now, does this refer to the general resurrection at the end? Or some other resurrection? Well, let's build a case 4 to begin with. Sleep, we understand, in verse 2, is a symbol for death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. And, you know, Paul referred to some who had... Die, died in Christ in 1 Thessalonians 4 as being asleep in Christ. So sleep can, is a symbol for death. Dust is also a symbol for, the, for death or for the grave. Remember, God told Adam in Genesis 3 19, your body's going to return to the dust of the earth from which it came. It's going to 
pass away. But then number three, sleep and dust refers to those not only dead, but also buried. And of course, everlasting life and everlasting contempt and shame indicate to us that one's condition spiritually is fixed at death. We talked about this last Sunday morning. And certainly, when you look at Israel, the history of Israel, they did have a concept of a bodily resurrection. Remember what God told Moses in Exodus 3? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Does that mean, even though Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac were dead, did that mean they were completely out of existence? No. And remember in the New Testament where he said, where Christ, you know, remember the Sadducees, what was their problem? What did the Sadducees deny? They denied the resurrection. And remember, Christ appeals back to this to show there is yet a future resurrection of all who are in the grave. Christ said, I am not the, you know, he said, God's not the God of the dead. I'm not the God of the dead, but of what? Of the, those living. But he also pointed out, I'm the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham. So what does that tell us? What's that? There you go, Sister Gail. There, you know, we, there is conscious existence after death. We, we, learned, we learned that last Sunday morning in our sermon. Rich man and, and Lazarus points this out as, as well. And certainly, remember what David said in 2 Samuel 12, verse 20, after his son that it was conceived in adultery with Bathsheba when he died? What, remember what David said? There you go. So that indicates, that ind- David, ind- David recognized there's hope beyond the grave, did he not? There is hope. I can go to him. And that's one of the most reassuring passages in the Old Testament, I would, I would suggest. Even Job said, after my skin, even this body is destroyed. Then without my flesh, I shall see God, Job 19, verse 26. And then, of course, Hosea pictured this. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. I will redeem them from death. O death, where where is thy sting? O death, where is thy destruction? Paul quoted this in 1 Corinthians 50, verses 54 and following, in regards to the last enemy, that it being death, being destroyed. And And it is interesting to note, as we look at this, and we're running out of time, but it is interesting to note that there are we have our own brethren who claim that that physical death is never going to be destroyed. In fact, they say God created physical death, which is absurd. You know, if physical death isn't going to be destroyed, we have no hope. In fact, if Christ didn't destroy physical death, if he didn't render physical death powerless at his resurrection, then we have no hope. The resurrection from the grave shows the power of God. Christ is the resurrection in the life. And he was demonstrated, declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection. And that tells me that if Christ can be resurrected, we can be resurrected. Did he not resurrect Lazarus? Again, that's the point of, of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. If the dead be not raised, and in particular, if Christ be not raised, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is still in the grave. And if Christ is still in the grave, what does that mean for you and I? We are lost. Our faith is vain. The preaching of the gospel is a lie. We, We have no hope. So, this is not a novel concept. Many, again, at the second coming of Christ, not all will come out of the grave. We understand there are those who will be alive. And they're going to be changed in a moment at the twinkling of an eye. And further, when you study the, the Bible, many is often used in the context, figuratively to include or mean all. Christ himself said in Matthew 20, verse 28, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. Now, did Christ say he came to die for, for, for does that mean he just died for, for, a, 
for a certain amount of people such as many or does that or does that figuratively mean he died for all he died for all. So, so there's a figurative use of the word many. And further, you look at Matthew 26, 28, that he shed his blood for, for many. Well, again, would that, not, would, the same, would that not also indicate all? Would we not also use many there figuratively to stand for all? That Christ shed his blood for all so that all have the possibility of obtaining the remission of sins? And is it not the case that all mankind can obtain remission of sins by obedience to the gospel? Is not the gospel for all? And we understand the answer to that to be yes. So we have a strong case for that. But, but again, to be fair, and we also, build, we also note there is a case against here. I want to give you both sides of the coin. Again, when you look at the context and we look at both sides of the coin, remember the time frame of the book from Babylon to Rome. And again, in no way does this deny any future re- the future resurrection to come. But again, if you study the context, it would certainly indicate the resurrection under consideration would not be the general resurrection of the dead. Remember, we're given both sides of the coin here. We've set forth the case for one. Let me give you the case that some make for, for this other view. Though many can indicate or figuratively stand for all, that may not be the case here. The plausible explanation might be that of a spiritual resurrection. Again, you look at the gospel, obedience to the gospel, that we are raised to walk in newness of life. Again, Ezekiel, who prophesied after the final fall of Jerusalem to Babylon, provided a message of hope through the dramatic vision of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37, one and following. And could it be, it is asked, that these two prophets describe the revival of a remnant in God's plan? And a remnant being restored but longer ranged, the coming of the Messiah and his establishing his eternal kingdom, as we see in Acts chapter 2. And certainly it could be the case, again, plausibly, possibly, and I'm not saying it is or isn't. I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you both sides of the coin here. To, get, to, to help you with in your own personal Bible study. It could possibly be that this resurrection here would refer to the fact that some Jews did accept Christ as Lord and Savior as evidence on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 obeyed the gospel and that others would reject Him. And this is the reason why God would instruct Paul to write what he did in Romans 1.3. The vast majority of the Jews then rejected the gospel to their everlasting shame, whereas a remnant believed and obeyed the gospel. And even if this did not refer to the general resurrection, but it is possible it would be a long-range prophecy of it, it is true there will only be two classes of individuals in the resurrection, those raised to everlasting life and those to everlasting to contempt. When you look at why Jerusalem was destroyed finally, as Christ prophesied in Matthew 24, It was payment in kind to the Jews from God for her rejection of the true king in his kingdom. And with that said, our time has run out. We'll pick up Wednesday night with verse number 3 and we'll try to finish up the chapter then. Any questions or comments? A lot to chew on, even in the first three verses, needless to say. But I hope our discussion has been great. We'll put a peg there and we'll pick up Wednesday night.